What's going on, everyone? I'm just a typical, average American here today to react and learn about the top 10 Americanisms that really annoy British people. I'm aghast. I'm shocked. There's stuff that Americans do that annoy people, that annoy British people. I, for one, can't believe it. Actually, I can. I can believe it. Actually, there's a there's American stuff that annoys Americans, that annoys me. Um, so this is basically going to be a list of things Americans say and do and expressions and stuff. Americanisms that British people just find annoying. And I'm honestly very interested of, gosh... It's almost like there's so many things that this could talk about. I'm just interested to see what are the 10, the top 10 that really stick out as like annoying in kind of a perverse way. I just want to know if Americans are going to be annoying, if we're annoying, what's the stuff that's really annoying so I can just do it all the time, be a bit of a rebel. <laughs> no, maybe I can avoid it. Maybe go on a little bit of a, a protest or I don't know. I'm just, I think it's going to be without a doubt, entertaining and funny to see what the most annoying stuff Americans do are. So let's take a look. For this list, we're rallying against the words, phrases, and clunky colloquialisms that have slipped into the English language, all okay. thanks to our American cousins. <laughs> so get your red pens out, the trash talk stops here. Oh. I hate that the flats are now called apartments. I hate that sweets are now called candy. And I hate that instead of nipping it to the shops, you nip it to the convenience store. Oh my god. Is it, is it just gonna be a whole lot of this? Is this the main gripe? Um, man, it's funny because I'm obviously experiencing this from the reverse, where they're like, oh, they call sweets candy. And it, uh, it even took me a second to be like, sweets? What does that mean? <laughs> that the flats are now called apartments. Flats are apartments. This is good stuff. Okay. I put to the convenience store. Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> Number 10, waiting on something. So we keep waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. An Americanism that really annoys British people waiting on something. I'm not sure what that means. In general, US prepositions can be pretty awkward, but wait on seems to have caught on in the UK too. Physically speaking, you can wait, as in delay or dally, on anything you like, on the platform, the doorstep, even on the car, if you intend to recline on its roof. But with non-physical things like decisions, bank transfers, and movie releases, you definitely wait for them. Oh, oh man, I was like really having to let this narrator like explain himself. Because I genuinely, and I think it's because, you know, I'm American, like, didn't understand. <laughs> Is that a symptom of the, the problem here or what? I didn't understand what the problem was. Um, so it's the specific phrasing of waiting on something? Gosh, that is just so freaking common in America. I would never, never have guessed that that wasn't common in Britain, honestly. So it's like wait, waiting on something, like waiting on the dentist. Uh, you'd rather say waiting for the dentist. I mean, I won't argue that that makes more grammatical sense, but there's something kind of just satisfying and comfortable to me about saying waiting on the zoo. <laughs> I'm waiting on the zoo to open, for gosh sakes. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think I can apologize for this one. We do this and we love it. Of course, waiters really do wait on, but most of the rest of us really don't. Oh, thanks huh. very much. Uh, you blonde okay. bastard. <laughs> Number nine, I have gotten. I mean, I, I had gotten out of control and I, I didn't even realize it. If got I have gotten? Man, this is like something I actually like about this. As confusing as these are to me is how specific these are. And right now, really focusing on uh, sayings or phrases, as an American, I have never considered strange or not British, even. If gotten were a noun, which it isn't, then you could conceivably have it. Maybe on toast or somewhere in your kitchen. But have we really gotten excited and anxious or suitably irate? <laughs> 
and when we splash out on designer t-shirts and tell our friends all about it the following day, we haven't gotten new clothes. We just got them. In fairness, most linguists- Oh, is that what it is? I was- I- I, I always have to wait for like the- the explanation. The pretext here. So it's, I have gotten, it's, it's the word gotten? Like it, it's more, this is, I feel like this is really getting a bit of a, being a bit of a stickler for grammar. Uh, I have gotten, I have got a new t-shirt. I have gotten. Maybe, I don't even know which one is grammatically correct at this point. Just agree that this sneaky suffix is rooted in traditional British English. Think huh. ill-gotten gains, but it's a mostly American habit nowadays. Huh. <laughs> Yeah, gotten. Gotten. Man, this this YouTube video is like gonna get me overthinking how I say stuff. Like, I never realized gotten is kind of a like slang-ish word. <laughs> huh. Might have gotten away with it too. If it wasn't for these blasted kids and their dog. Then you kids deserve a big thanks. Number eight, you do the math. You do the math, okay. So this, so it's another phrase. <laughs> you do the math. You do the math, really? That annoys British people. That phrase, you do the math. When do you ever, when are you ever even in a circumstance to say this, let alone get annoyed at it? Right, let's do the math. This one just <laughs> doesn't add up. Why study <laughs> mathematics plural just to be told to do the math singular? Given that this phrase is usually dropped at the end of a debate as some kind of all-conquering conversation ender and insurmountable point prover, we Brits can be quick to bristle whenever it's issued our way. Wow, wait, this, so this is, <laughs> they're saying this can, and truthfully, they are correct, this is like the zinger, the conversation ender. Ah, you think these Americanisms really annoy British people? No, 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 you do the math, and then I just walk away. And I've, I've won. We would suggest going back to school, but that throws up the whole college university hoo-ha, and there just aren't enough hours in the day. One way or another, it's a mathematical fact. It's, it's like Vegas. Number seven, <laughs> which pants are you wearing? Huh? Clumsy line of questioning on an X-rated phone line, or innocent inquiry about another person's oh. dress code? Just shut it and put your pants on! Of course, the underwear or trousers talk all depends upon which side of the Atlantic you're asking from. Wait, 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 wait. Which pants are you wearing? I am so confused why this would annoy anyone. Are we just talking about how Americans use the word pants? Is that is that the problem here? Remember, your car needs petrol unless it needs gas, which isn't the same fuel used for older style ovens. Sneakers are trainers, although there's nothing especially <laughs> sly about them, and Band-Aid means plaster, but it's also a seminal oh. 80s charity single, in case you forgot. So we really are talking about, like, pants, and in Britain, they're called trousers? Is that, is that, is that what we're getting at here? <laughs> Number six, finding... Yeah, that's what we're getting at. I think that was literally it, huh? Which pants are you wearing? So you'd rather... <laughs> Trouser is like, is a word in American English. Although it's very fancy. It's like fancy pants. <laughs> so we all picture British people out there wearing fancy pants. We're here wearing our normal pants. And uh, yeah, we're just living our lives. <laughs> I, I, th I think I just find it really amusing that that's on the list, pants. The first floor. Okay, number six, finding the first floor. Number six, finding the first floor. Oh, I'm already guessing that this is going to be how British people might call it the ground floor. Or, or in America, the first floor is the bottom floor. And maybe in Britain, it may be the next floor up off the ground is the first floor. But for us, that would be the second floor. Is, I, is that what we're talking about here? To another small but significant difference between British <laughs> and American English, and one which, having crept over from the States, can cause understandable confusion in the UK. Uh... When you walk into a building at street level, you're on the ground floor, not the first floor. Yeah, okay, that's, that's literally what it is. Yeah, in America, we definitely, definitely always say that the floor on the bottom, on the ground, is the first 
floor. The first floor you walk into. What do you want? What do you want from us? And then the, the second floor, the next floor up is, yeah, second floor. You know, I'm okay with this. Um, it is kind of funny that, man, I've heard the word ground floor, and I would know what that means, but we just don't say it, really. I mean, maybe here and there, but not really. Interesting. So in Britain, is first floor catching on a little bit? Is it catching on? The first floor is one flight of stairs upwards, but the Americanism says that that level is the second floor. Oh, it's yeah. It's not, but you can what? start to see why it's vital that the lift's in full working order. Huh. Number five, have huh. a nice day. Huh. That's an interesting one. That is an interesting little difference between Britain and America. Ground floor or first floor? I would never have thought of that. <laughs> huh. Uh, number five, have a nice day. How are you? How are you going to get mad at have a nice day? What, what could possibly? Uh, us Americans are out here saying have a nice day, and that's going to be annoying. What do you want from us? What do you want? Us to not say have a nice day? I mean, I should probably let the the narrator explain here. Thanks. Have a good day. Don't tell me what to do. In general, <laughs> most Brits balk at Americans' apparently unbridled enthusiasm, but it's difficult to okay. criticize their commitment to peppy customer service. Okay. But phrases like good job and have a great day can sound forced and insincere when muttered with the moodiness of a Brit cold caller. What? Oh, so, hmm. All right, I kind of get it. It's the, it's how insincere it is. It's how often we use it. Have a nice day. Yeah, that is a very like, uh, like industry service person thing to say. Have a nice day. Although it is still like nice. It's just like polite rather than genuine kindness. But I think Americans are just so used to that. And like, we get it. Like if someone's at the grocery store serving you, bagging your groceries, um, I understand that they're, it's kind of part of their job to be friendly and say, have a nice day, whether they hate me or not, for, <laughs> or, you know, whatever they think. They don't want to have to be there saying that. And I think Americans just almost sympathize with it. So we don't get annoyed when people say, have a nice day, even if they clearly don't mean it, uh, I guess. Why the f do you keep asking me that? It's all in the delivery, this one. Yeah. Of course, everyone should try to be good to everyone else, and wishing someone well is a lovely thing to do. But yeah. let's say it like we mean it. Okay, uh, this is, that's nitpicking a bit. I think that's nitpicking. Like, we're trying. We're trying, and honestly, personally, I just don't blame, especially, like, American, you know, uh, minimum wage workers for not meaning it. Being like, hey, have a nice day. And they just, you know, even if I get that, I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Number four, quite right. <laughs> not, not quite my tempo. Again, this Americanism mostly frustrates because of the misunderstandings it can inspire. Quite. Is it, is it the word quite? That's the annoying thing here, or...? We Brits mostly use quite as a middle ground between not at all and absolutely, for words like dangerous, delicate, or difficult. If something's quite damaged, it's not completely beyond repair. So, with the dis... Oh, interesting. Oh, that's interesting. So, in Britain, quite, that's quite beautiful. Means it's somewhat beautiful. If it's quite broken, Somewhat broken. It's still fixable. In America, if you say quite, if you say something is quite amazing, you're putting some emphasis on it. Like, quite is, like, emphasizing. Like, you mean it. Like, that is very beautiful. That is quite beautiful. So that's a, that's a big difference. I never thought about that. I never knew that. That's, that's fascinating. I'm getting a pop-up. This pop-up is quite annoying. Okay. Dispatch of the sergeant, we will now be able to concentrate on the eradication of our hoodie infestation. Quite right. But the US uses quite as a blanket substitute for very. Yeah. So if something's quite extraordinary, then it really is extraordinary. Yeah, wow. I never knew that. I never knew that. I think of quite as a sort of a British sounding word. Like quite right. Or, you know, <laughs> something like that. So I actually didn't realize in Britain, Quite is 
not as aggressively meaningful as in America. Interesting. Huh. Huh. But problems come if you're described as quite intelligent or quite beautiful. Right. For self-esteem's sake, which is it? <sighs> right, right. So in Britain, if someone's quite smart, they're smart. You know, pretty smart. Good level of smart. In America, if you're quite smart, that's a, that it's a that's a compliment. So that's actually like a big difference. Right, right. Number three, alternative facts. Did you throw mm. Jeremy Paxman out of a window? Oh, well, kind of. Oh. A term from the top, this idea was first formed following former US press secretary Sean Spicer's insistence that Donald Trump's presidential inauguration ceremony was well attended, despite photos seemingly showing that it wasn't. Counselor to alternative facts. So this is some kind of from like American American government mumbo jumbo talk. The president, Kellyanne Conway, famously defended Spicer, claiming that his version of events was built not on falsehoods, but on alternative facts. <laughs> and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point re Alternative facts. Yeah, that, that phrase kind of annoys me as well. Like, what the heck does that mean? Alternative facts? Wait a minute, alternative facts? It's jargon worthy of the British writer George Orwell, but we can thank America for making it mainstream and for providing uh, the buzzword for post-truth politics. I, I don't feel like I hear it. I don't hear that word too much. Alternative facts. I feel like that kind of had its moment and left. Thank goodness. It's a very American government like thing to say. Uh, he was just experiencing alternative facts. I'm, uh, it's funny. The reporter was immediately like, what? Did you just say alternative facts? What? Number two, the least worst option. I'm doing this for the city, <laughs> not you. You're the least worst option. I'll run a rock. The least worst option? This isn't even said that often. Like, this is not commonly said in America. Like, it would take me a second if someone in America said this, I'd be like, what did you just say? The least worst option. I mean, I get it. It, it kind of is meant to make you sound really smart or something. Well, that's the least worst option. Like it's, it's <laughs> the option that is the, the least, all the options are bad. You're just choosing the one that's not the most bad. Hmm. Round on another apparently diplomatic double negative and three mm. words which really mean nothing at all. Right. Because what can a least worst option ever really be? That's <laughs> true. If there's something worse than the worst possible something, then the first worst something was never the worst in the first place. We have a better bad idea oh, than gosh. this. Oh gosh. This is the best bad idea we have, sir. <laughs> the, the best bad idea is same vibe as least worst option available. <laughs> By far. It's pretty simple, really. Anything that's less worse than anything else can't possibly be labeled the worst. And the least worst of those things that are less worse is actually the best option available. Right, right. It's just the best option. It's a double negative. It means the best option, the least bad. So, and it's just to make you sound smart. Th this would kind of annoy me as well. <sighs> Hallelujah. Huh. Number one, I could care less. I could care less. Classic. Classic Americanism. I'm glad this deserves to be number one. Actually, I actually hear this like from Americans. Uh, <laughs> I I've said it. I'm sure I could care less. Doesn't make any sense. That means you are capable of caring less, which means you care to some extent. Which is you know <laughs> when you say this, what Americans are trying to say is I couldn't care less. Like we're trying to be mean. We can't even do that right. I could care less. I just want to do my job. Delivered huh. when someone's past the point of caring, and if you're huh. stuck with this video, then this presumably isn't you, so bravo. I couldn't huh. care less makes perfect sense. Lose two letters and an apostrophe, right. however, and it definitely does not. <laughs> no. I really couldn't care less. I could. Oh, they say it correctly in Harry Potter. That's interesting. Now, if someone said this in America, I wouldn't even think anything of it. it it's quite common. Oh, there I go, saying quite. See, it's very calm. It's quite common. I, c I could care less. Care less implies that there's still some caring to be had, which is rarely what the person speaking wants to convey. I could care less is like conceding that worse things have happened, but with regard to American <laughs> English, they rarely have.
because that, oh, as an no. expression for not or hardly caring, just makes no sense. <laughs> oh no, I didn't know that bothered so many British people. Sorry about that, but to be quite honest, I could care less. You know, <laughs> okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. That was good. That was very good. Quite good. Uh, okay, I gotta, I gotta calm down with the quites. This was by Watch Mojo UK, and I liked it. I liked it quite a lot. <laughs> uh, this was actually a really good list. A bit confusing at times. I actually didn't understand what the annoying thing was, which probably makes Americans extra annoying when we don't even understand what's annoying about what we're saying. But it was also just interesting to hear some of the sayings that are kind of common in both Britain and America, but, but a little bit different sometimes, just words here and there. And apparently the American way is a bit annoying. So <laughs> I don't know. It's funny how most of these are actually very typical to me. Like I hear this stuff all the time. So I don't think anything of it. So that was kind of fun. Uh, getting American English put in the spotlight so I could see some of the funny stuff about it. That's a bit annoying to people outside of America. This is good. This was quite good. Anyway, if you enjoyed this as well, Feel free to give this video a like or leave a comment. And if you're interested in more videos like this, me reacting to Britain and British culture and just stuff in Britain I've never seen before or learned about, feel free to subscribe for more. And until then, thanks for watching and see you next time.